And in this talk, I want to talk to you about accessibility and the idea that it's not just supporting screen readers. I think all too often, when we think about accessibility, we make sure our sites work for those who use screen readers. And we think that if we've done that, then we've ticked the accessibility checkbox. But we haven't. There are so many other people out there that we're sort of forgetting. So a little bit about me. I'm a final year software engineering student at Oxford Brooks. And like Ben said, this time last week, I was handing in my dissertation. I also have a bit of a thing for icon fonts, and I'm determined to get rid of them on the internet. But that's a whole other talk. I'm also dyslexic, and my goal is to try and make the world a more accessible place to everybody. So before we can really look about making the web more accessible to those who don't just use screen readers, I think we need to go back to basics and really look at what accessibility even is. So according to the BBC, accessibility is the word used to describe whether a product, for example, a website, can be used by people of all abilities and disabilities. So the way I like to see it is it's like an umbrella. It's not just one person. It's a collection of people with different experiences and different needs. And a really good example of this is something that Microsoft recently did. They created the Inclusivity Toolkit Manual. And they've broken down accessibility into groups of people. So we've looked at the long-term disabilities, such as going blind or being deaf, and then gone into temporary things, such as if we break our arm or we've got a cataract. And something I particularly like is they've gone into situational things, things that we normally wouldn't say are a disability, but do affect our ability to do tasks. Now, I'm sure we've all experienced this, being on the phone, while trying to unlock our front door with one hand. And that's the type of thing we're thinking about, things that affect our ability to do a task. But are we still forgetting some people? Well, I think we are. So I went ahead and edited Microsoft's inclusivity manual to make it more accurate in my opinion. So here we are. I added a cognitive section. The previous version tends to focus on things that we can see. For example, you can see if somebody has one arm or not. But we never really see what's going on in our brains. And I think this is something that we all often forget. So we're going to be looking at these groups of people, and we'll look at things that we do as developers that have negative impacts on their experience. But more importantly, we're going to be looking at the small, simple things that we can do as designers and developers to improve their experience and make the web a more accessible place for everybody. So let's begin with touch. So touch is all to do with movement. For example, you might have difficulty moving your hands, or you might have RSI and find moving your hand really painful at times. So when we look at touch, we can see these as permanent things, temporary and situational, like I said before. So let's look at an example of something we do as developers that can have a real negative impact on those with touch issues. Problem. So we tend to do this thing as developers of creating really long web pages that aren't the most accessible. A really good example of this is most e-commerce websites. And in this example, I'm showing you Boohoo. So they're selling clothes. And you can see this is a really, really big web page. And there is no way of getting to the top unless you scroll all the way back. Now, if you're somebody who finds using a mouse really hard or painful, then if you want to go back to the top, you have to keep scrolling. There's no easy way of getting there. We're forcing people to do something that might be causing them harm and something they might find really challenging. But I also feel there's a really, really simple fix for this. And that's simply by adding a back to the top link. Now, the importance of a back to the top link is we're giving the, somebody an easy method of getting to the top of the page. We're not forcing someone to keep scrolling and do unnecessary work. And I think the importance of the back to the top link is that we provide it as soon as somebody starts scrolling. So it doesn't matter where in the page they are. 
if they scrolled a little bit, they're halfway through, or at the very bottom of the page, we still provide them an easy way of getting to the top. And this kind of links on to the next thing that we do. We provide small clickable areas. So in this example, we use Google. And in this top nav bar, you can see that if you want to click on that link, you have to be exactly on the word, not a pixel or two out, exactly on it. Now, if you find movement quite challenging, you might find it really hard to try and get your cursor on this word. We all take it for granted that how easy this can be. And this is another thing that I think has such a simple and easy fix. We can provide large areas for links. So in this example, this is Boohoo again. And you can see that as soon as the cursor goes anywhere near the link, such as women's, the whole box is highlighted. So if you're not very good at being precise with your mouse, it doesn't matter. As long as you're in that highlighted area, which is quite big, you're good. You can click on that link and access the content. We're not making people work for something. So the next set of people we're going to be looking at is those with visual difficulties, such as people who are colorblind. Now, there are three main types of colorblindness. Duotopia, proatopia, and triotopia. I'm really sorry, I probably really <laughs> butchered those names. So on this slide, we can see in the top left-hand corner, we can see a picture of pencils. And this is how most of us will see this, people who aren't colorblind. In the top right, we can see how someone with duotopia would view it. And in the bottom left, proatopia, and the bottom right, triotopia. Now we can see if you have duotopia or proatopia, red and greens are the same color. They're sort of that gray, browny, yellow color. There's not a lot of difference. And with uh, triotopia, it's all shades of pinks and blues. So greens and blues are the same color. There's not a lot of difference. So one in 12 men in the UK are colorblind, and one in 200 women. So that's a lot of people out there that we're affecting. So something we really like to do as designers and developers is pick colors that don't have a high contrast. And a great example of this is this e-commerce website. Now, this site sells craft supplies. And the main problem is, is they're using yellow and white, two of the worst colors you could possibly pick. Now, I don't know if any of you can see this, but there's a shop button somewhere hidden on this page. Uh, it's just up next to the home page here. Now, I only found that button when I accidentally hovered on it and learned that its hover styles were red. Likewise, there's a login and register button hidden on this site. And I only found it when I was taking the screenshot for this slide. So as I said, yellow and white are particularly bad colors to use. They don't pass the AA or AAA standards for WCAG. And as you can see, the contrast is 1.09. And that's really low. Now, if someone like me, who's not colorblind and has relatively good eyesight, is struggling to see these links, how can we expect somebody who is colorblind to see them? I mean, the whole point of the site I've just showed you is to sell goods. But if you can't see the shop button, how are you ever going to sell anything? So this also has such an easy and simple fix. We don't have to go away and rebuild our entire website, go back to the designers and get them to change the, all of the color scheme. We can simply change one color. So here, it's the same website, Craft Stars, but I've changed the link color of shop and login and register to black. Now, I'm not breaking the styles of the site. They were already using black text for their all categories or the total of your cart. But I've made these two buttons a lot more visible. We can all see them. And as you can see, black and yellow have a very good contrast. They're 19.58 which means anybody can see them. It doesn't matter if you are colorblind and you can't see these different shades, you'll still pick up there is a really big difference. So the next group of people that we're going to be looking at is those who have trouble hearing. 
So until last night, this light said, dead or hard of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so being dyslexic often means I have some very bad typos in my work. <laughs> so hearing loss tends to refer to the diminishing ability of being able to hear, whereas deafness refers to the inability to understand speech or recognize sound at all. Now, well, Think to the NHS, about one in six people in the UK suffer, some, suffer from some form of hearing loss. So that would be people who can't hear at all to those who can still hear a bit. And the thing we tend to do as developers is, that's not very good, is we like to create videos, but we don't provide captions. And you might be like, Saren, why are you showing us YouTube? YouTube's meant to be really good for captions. And the answer is, it's a bit mixed. YouTube, with their captioning, it's all down to the author of the video. And if they've chosen to tick a little box that says yes to captions. So this video here is some lady telling you all about makeup. And the idea of the video is she wants to save you money by showing you all these high-end luxury products that aren't worth it. But she has no captions. So if you can't hear, you're missing the key message of her video. You're not picking up on what she thinks you should or shouldn't be spending your money on. And this links to the next thing that YouTube do. So here is a video all about bullet journaling. And it's a beginner's guide to bullet journaling. So it's for all audiences who want to get started in something. And this video has no captions again, but it has an interesting feature of being able to add subtitles yourself. So YouTube has this feature that allows authors to let their viewers write the subtitles of their videos, which is really good. We're not having weird computer-generated captions. We're letting real people write captions for real people that they can understand. But the problem is, these still aren't compulsory. So at this moment in time, this video has no captions whatsoever. So a video that's aimed at beginners isn't accessible to everybody. If you can't hear, then you're not getting any of this content. Now, a company that are really good at captioning is the BBC. The BBC captions every single video on iPlayer, which means it's accessible to everybody. Now, we know captions can be a lot of work, but it is such a small thing that we can do as developers to make our content more accessible. If we're producing videos and you're not providing captions, then your content is only getting out to the people who can hear. And you're missing a huge amount of people that your message is never going to get across to. So the next section we're going to look at is cognitive. And cognitive is all to do with the brain. So we're going to begin looking at epilepsy. Now, epilepsy is a condition that affects the brain and causes repeated seizures. seizures. Sorry. And according to the NHS, about one in a hundred people suffer from it. Now, I know the numbers here aren't as big as one in six for people who have a hearing impairment, but I kind of think that these people are some of the most important out there because depending on what we have on our websites, we could cause someone real harm so for obvious reasons, I'm not going to show you an example of something bad. But I'll show you this. Now, I'm sure we've all seen this little dancing parrot. <laughs> and the normal one is OK. But someone's also produced a sped up version that all it does is flash and blink and never stops. It's one of the most annoying things in Slack. Now. I'm not saying that we have to get rid of this dancing parrot or any other animations we might have on our site. I just think we need to think about them and think about if we can slow them down. Simply through slowing down the animation, we don't have to get rid of it, but we're making it more accessible. We're making sure that it doesn't hurt anybody. So the W3C recommends that any flashing content that flashes more than three times per second is bad and it's inaccessible. And this means that 
we can still keep our animations. We just need to make sure that they're not flashing more than three times. So the next area we're going to be looking at is dyslexia. Now, when most people think of dyslexia, they think of people having a hard time with reading or write, sorry, spelling. But it's a lot more than that, and dyslexia is very broad. It covers lots of things, such as difficulty with reading, writing, maths, short-term memory retention, for example. But dyslexia is also very broad, and it affects everybody in a different way. So you might get on one hand, one scale of the spectrum, somebody who has quite severe dyslexia and finds reading really difficult. But on the other end, you might get a 30-year-old who has only just found out they're dyslexic. So according to the NHS, one in 10 people in the UK suffer from some form of dyslexia. So that's an awful lot of people. And something we do as developers that's not very great is we like to use all uppercase text. So this example is the British Dyslexia Association. <laughs> and these are one of the people who strongly recommend that you don't use all uppercase text. But they use it in so many places on their website. So the reason that uppercase text is bad is, as humans, we don't read every single character in a word. We tend to read the pattern. So when it's all lowercase, we're reading the wave and the shape of the word. But when it's uppercase, we just get a block. There is no shape anymore. Every single line of that text has become a block. And it's a lot harder to read. There have been studies that show that making all your text uppercase actually slows down the reading speed for everybody because we all suddenly have to stop and think about what this word is. We can't see the shape. So I also think this is such an easy fix, and we quite often use it just for the aesthetics. So if you're using this to make your text stand out on the page and you want to send a message to the people viewing it, just make the text bold you're still making sure that it stands out and it pops and people are picking up that key piece of information, but you're not making it hard to read. In fact, bold text is actually easier for dyslexics to read because each of the characters is a lot more defined. And another thing we could do is just stop using it altogether. So here's an example of the British Dyslexia Association website again. But as you can see, on the buttons at the top, I've taken away the styles that make it all up a case. The buttons still look the same. They have the same purpose. They're taking people to information. But we've made them a lot more easy to read. So the dyslexia button up here, which is designed to, for dyslexics to click on to get more information, has become a lot more easy for them to see and go and get the information that they need. Another thing we like to do is stop people from highlighting text on our sites. And here's an example. This is fanfiction.com, and it's a website where people can write stories about popular TV and culture. So you can see here that they've disabled being able to highlight text on page where authors have written content. Now, the main problem with this is I use my cursor to guide myself along in the page so I don't lose track of where I am. And I quite often highlight the text so I can see at what point I'm on. But on this site, I can't do that. So I find this really hard to read. Another thing we like to do is disable right-clicking. So here's an example. This is House of CB. And I can highlight the text, but I can't right-click. So while I can use my cursor to help guide myself along, I can't right-click. And the reason why both these things are so important is, as a dyslexic, I use this feature in my Mac. And here's an example in the BBC of where I highlight text. So I highlight the text and right-click and use the speech option. 
A 94-year-old American is celebrating more than four decades of working at McDonald's restaurants. Lorraine Mora of Evansville, Indiana, works two shifts per week, 44 years after joining the hamburger chain. The nonagenarian great-grandmother first joined in 1973 after her husband retired due to disability. So quite a lot of the content I read on the web, I choose to access it in this way because it's a lot quicker for me to get the information. And when I was writing my dissertation, I did this on practically every single journal or paper that I had to read to do a literature review on. So I know quite a lot of people like to disable highlighting or right-clicking to try and prevent people from stealing their content. But let's face it, if someone is so dedicated in trying to steal your content, they're going to find another way. As developers, we all know about dev tools. We can get it that way. Or people, if people are really, really dedicated to getting this, they're just going to screenshot it or write it all out again by hand. So while you may be doing this to stop people stealing content, you're also disabling people like myself using these built-in built features, which makes content so much more accessible for me. So please stop doing these things. So all the people I've mentioned today, they're not a one in a million use case. They're real people out there. They're not just numbers. But if we were going to look at the numbers, we can take this room, for example. There are about 400 people in here. So statistically, that would mean two women are colorblind, 33 men are. We ha have four people who have epilepsy. And there are 40 people with dyslexia. So that's not a one in a million. That's a lot of people who are visiting your sites who don't normally access it in the way that you think they would. So I haven't covered all of accessibility today either. Accessibility is a massive topic, and we would probably be here all week if we covered all of it. So I highly recommend that you go away and read the Microsoft Inclusivity Manual. It's really good, intensive, and covers a lot of these things. However, it doesn't cover the cognitive side. So please be aware of that. If you want to find out more about the cognitive side, I highly recommend going away and actually reading the Dyslexia Association Style Guide. While they don't adhere to it themselves, it's, re <laughs> <laughs> it's really good and informative, and doesn't just cover web, it covers physical materials as well. So when you go away today, I don't want you to think of these people as just numbers. I want you to think of real people. As we probably all know somebody who is affected by one of these things without even realizing it. I see this as our chance to be superheroes. We, as developers and designers, have the power to do have the power to make a difference and do good. We have a power to change people's lives without even realizing it. And I know it may seem silly that changing text from being all uppercase to being lowercase will have a difference, but to some people, it really will. So please go away today and be those superheroes that I believe you all are, and go and change the web to be a better place for everybody. Thank you.